Chapter 11 of The Moon of Honey and its events with sundry remarks on magic, the whole adorned with moral reflections useful to the young. The many terraced garden of the villa was planted with olive and tamarind, orange and cypress. But in the lowest of them all, a crescent over whose wall one could look down upon one of the paths that threaded the hillside, there was a pavement of white marble. A spring wet from the naked rock and fell into a circular basin. From this small streamlets issued, and watered the terrace in narrow grooves between the slabs. This garden was sacred to lilies, and because of its apt symbolism, Cyril Grey had chosen it for the scene of Lisa's dedication to Artemis. He had set up a small triangular altar of silver, and it was upon this that Sister Clara and her disciples came thrice nightly to make their incantations. The ritual of the moon might never be celebrated during daylight. Upon the evening of Monday, after the adoration of the setting sun, Sister Clara called Lisa aside and led her to this garden. There she and the handmaidens unclothed her and washed her from head to foot in the waters of the sacred spring. Then she put upon her a solemn oath that she would follow out the rules of the ritual, not speaking to any man except her chosen, not leaving the protection of the circle, not communicating with the outer and uninitiated world, but on the other hand devoting herself wholly to the invocation of the moon. Then she clothed her in a specially prepared and consecrated garment. It was not of the same pattern as those of the order. It was a loose vestment of pale blue covered with silver tissue, and the secret sigils of the moon were woven cunningly upon its hem. It was frail but of great volume, and the effect was that the wearer seemed to be wrapped in a mist of moonlight. In a language and mysterious chant, Sister Clara raised her voice, and her acolytes kept a chord on their mandolins. It was an incantation of fervour and of madness, the madness of things chaste, remote and inscrutable. At the conclusion she took Lisa by the hand and gave her a new name, a mystic name engraved upon a moonstone set in a silver ring which she put upon her finger. This name was Iliel. It had been chosen on account of its sympathy of number to the moon, for the name is Hebrew, in which language its characters have the value of 81, the square of 9, the sacred number of the moon. But other considerations helped to determine the choice of this name. The letter L in Hebrew refers to Libra, the sign under which she had been born, and it was surrounded with two letters, I, to indicate her embellishment by the force of creation and chastity, which the wise men of old hid in that hieroglyph. The final L signified the divinity of her new being, for this is the Hebrew word for God and is commonly attached by the sages to divers roots, to imply that these ideas have been manifested in individuals of angelic nature. This instruction had been given to Lisa in advance. Now that it was ceremonially conferred upon her, she was struck to the heart by its great meaning. Her passion for Cyril Grey had been gross and vehement, almost vulgar, he had translated it into terms of hunger after holiness, awful aspiration of utter purity. Nor Rhea Sylvia, nor Samel, nor any other mortal virgin had ever glowed to inherit more glorious a destiny, to feel such infinite exaltation of chastity. Even the thought of Cyril himself fell from her like a stain. He had become no more than a necessary evil. At that moment she could have shaken off the trammels of humanity itself and joined Sister Clara in her ecstatic mood, passed on, imperial vorteress, in maiden meditation, fancy free. Only the knowledge of her sublime task inured her to its bitter taste. From these meditations she was awakened by the voice of Sister Clara. O oh, Iliel, O oh, Iliel, O oh, Iliel, there is a cloud upon the sea. The two girls chimed in with the music of their mandolins. It is growing dark, I am afraid, cried Sister Clara. The girls quavered in their melody. We are alone in the sacred grove, O Artemis, be near us, protect us from all evil. Protect us from all evil, echoed the two children. There is a shape in the cloud, there is a stern in the darkness, there is a stranger in the sacred grove. Artemis, Artemis! Artemis shrilled the girls, their instruments fierce and agitated. At that moment a great cry arose from the men who were in waiting on the upper terrace. It was a scream of abject fear, 
inarticulate save for the one word, Pan. They fled shrieking in every direction as Cyril Grey, clad in a rough dress of goatskins, bounded from the topmost terrace into their midst. In another moment, leaping down the garden, he reached the parapet that overlooked the little terrace where the girls crouched moaning. He sprung down among them. Sister Clara and her disciples fled with cries like startled seabirds, but he crushed Iliel to his breast, then flung her over his shoulder and strode triumphant to the house. Such was the magical ceremony devised by the adepts, a commemoration or dramatic reproduction of the legend of the capture of Diana by Pan. It is, of course, from such rites that all dramatic performance developed. The idea is to identify oneself, in fault by means of action, with the deities whom one desires to invoke. The idea of presenting a story ceremonially may have preceded the ritual, and the gods may have been mere sublimations of eponymous heroes or personifications of abstract ideas, but ultimately it is much the same. Admit that the genius of man is divine, and the question, which is the cart and which the horse, becomes as pointless as if one asked it about an automobile. The ensuing month from the middle of November until the week before Christmas was a honeymoon, but annual appetite was scarce more than an accidental adjunct. The human love of Cyril and Lisa had been raised to inconceivable heights by the backbone of spirituality and love of mankind that lay behind its manifestations. Moreover, everything was attuned to it. Nothing detracted from it. The lovers never lost sight of each other for an hour. They had their fill and will of love, but in a way, and with an intensity of which worldly lovers never dream. Even sleep was to them but as a vow of many colours cast upon their rapture. In their dreams they still pursued each other and attained each other, beneath bluer skies upon seas that laughed more melodiously than that which lay between them and Cap Three, through gardens of more gladness than their own, and upon slopes that stretched eternally to the palaces of the Epiphorean. For four weeks no word came from outside, with one exception, when Sister Clara brought a telegram to Cyril. It was unsigned and the message curt. About August 1st was all its purport. The better the day, the better the deed, cried Cyril gaily. Iliel questioned him. Just magic, he answered. She did not pursue the subject. She divined that the matter did not concern her, and she regretted even that microscopial interruption. But although Ilya was kept from all knowledge of external events, it was by dint of steel. The Black Lodge had not been idle. Brother Onyofrio, in charge of the garrison, had found his hands full. But his manoeuvres had been successful. The enemy had not even secured their first point of vantage, a material link with the Brotherhood. It is a law of magic that causes and effects lie on the same plane. You may be able to send a ghost to frighten someone you dislike, but you must not expect the ghost to use a club or steal a pocket handkerchief. Also, most practical magic starts on the material plane and proceeds to create images on other planes. Thus, to evoke a spirit, we first obtain the objects necessary for its manifestation and create subtler forms of the same nature from them. The butterfly net was worked on exactly the same lines. Morality enters into magic no more than into art or science. It is only when the effects react upon the mortal nature of man that this question arises. The Venus de Medici is neither good nor bad, it is merely beautiful, but its reaction on the mind of an Antony Comstock or a Harry Four may be disastrous, owing to the nature of such minds. One can settle the details of a murder over the telephone, but one should not blame the telephone. The laws of magic are closely related to those of other physical sciences, a century or so ago, men were ignorant of a dozen important properties of matter, thermal conductivity, electrical resistance, opacity to the X-ray, spectroscopic reaction, and others even more occult. Magic deals principally with certain physical forces, still unrecognised by the vulgar. But those forces are just as real, just as material, if indeed you can call them so, for all things are ultimately spiritual, as properties like radioactivity, weight and hardness. The difficulty in defining and measuring them lies principally in the subtlety of their relation to life. Living protoplasm is identical with dead protoplasm in all but the facts of life. 
The Mass is a magical ceremony performed with the object of endowing a material substance with divine virtue. But there is no material difference between the consecrated and the unconsecrated wafer. Yet there is an enormous difference in the moral reaction upon the communicant, recognising that its principal sacrament is only one of an infinite number of possible experiments in talismanic magic. The Church has never denied the reality of that art, but treated its exponents as rivals. She dare not lop the branch on which she sits. On the other hand, the sceptic, finding it impossible to deny the effects of ceremonial consecration, is compelled to refer the cause to faith, and sneers that faith is the real miracle. Whereupon the Church miningly agrees, but the magician, holding the balance between the disputants and insisting upon the unity of nature, asserts that all force is one in origin. He believes in the miracle, but maintains that it is exactly the same kind of miracle as charging a laden jar with electricity. You must use the moral indicator to test one, an electrical indicator to test the other. The balance in the test tube will not reveal the change in either. The Black Lodge knew well enough that the weak strand in the butterfly net was Lisa's untrained mind. Its white-hot flame of enthusiasm, radiating passionate love, was too active to assail directly, even could they have succeeded in communicating with it. But they were content to watch and wait for the reaction, should it come, as they knew it must ultimately do. Eros finds and Terios, always on his heels, soon or late he will be supplanted, unless he had the wit to feed his fire with the fuel of friendship. In the meanwhile, it was the best chance to work upon the mind through the body. Had they been able to procure a drop of Iliel's blood, she might have been as easy a prey as that unlucky engine driver of the Paris-Rome Rapide. But Sister Clara saw to it that not so much as a now pine of Iliel escaped careful magical destruction, and Brother Onio Frio organised a nightly patrol of the garden, so that no physical breach of the circle should be made. The man in charge of the mission of the Black Lodge was one Uthright, a dull and inaccurate pendant without imagination or real magical perception. Like most black magicians, he tippled habitually, and his capacity for inflicting damage upon others was limited by his inordinate conceit. He hated Cyril Grey as much as he hated anyone, because his books had been reviewed by that bright spirit in his most bitterly ironical strain in the Emerald Tablet, the famous literary review edited by Jack Flynn, and Grey had been at particular pains to point out elementary blunders in translation, which showed that Arthrite was comically ignorant of the languages in which he boasted scholarship. But he was not the man for the task set him by Douglas. His pomposity always stood in his way. A man fighting for life is exceptionally a fool if he insists on stopping every moment to admire himself. Douglas had chosen him for one of the curious backhanded reasons which so often appeal to people of perverse intelligence. It was because he was harmless that he was selected to work harm. A democracy often chooses its generals on the same principle. A capable man might overthrow the Republic. It apparently prefers to be overthrown by a capable en enemy. But Douglas had backed him with a strong executive. Abdul Bey knew no magic and never would. But he had a desperate passion for Lisa and a fanatical hatred of Grey, whom he credited, at the suggestion of Balak, with the death of his father. He had almost unlimited resources, social and financial, there could hardly have been a better man for the external part of the work. The third commissioner was the brains of the business. He was a man highly skilled in black magic in his own way. He was a lean, cadaverous Protestant Irishman named Gates tall with the scholar's stoop. He possessed real original talent, with now and then a flash of insight which came close to genius. But though his intellect was keen and fine, it was in some way confused, and there was a lack of virility in his make-up. His hair was long, lank and unkept, his teeth were neglected, and he had a habit of physical dirt which was so obvious as to be repulsive even to a stranger. But there was no harm in him. He had no business in the Black Lodge at all. It was but one of his romantic fantasies to pose as a terribly wicked fellow. Yet he took it seriously enough and was ready to serve Douglas in any scheme, however atrocious, which was secure his advancement in the lodge. He was only there through muddle-headedness, so far as he had an object beyond the satisfaction of his vanity. It was innocent in itself, 
the acquisition of knowledge and power. He was entirely the dupe of Douglas, who found him a useful stalking horse, for Gates had a considerable reputation in some of the best circles in England. Douglas had chosen him for this business on excellent points of cunning, for he neither hated nor loved his intended victims, and so was likely to interpret their actions without passion or prejudice. It was this interpretation that Douglas most desired. Douglas had seen him personally, rare privilege, before he left for Naples and explained his wishes somewhat as follows. The fall upright was to blunder pedantically along with the classical methods of magical assault, partly on the chance of a hit, partly to keep Grey busy, and possibly to lead him to believe that the main attack lay there. Meanwhile he, Gates, was to devote himself on the quiet to divining the true nature of Grey's purpose. This information was essential. Douglas knew that it must be something tremendous, that the forces which Shield was working to evoke were cosmic in scope. He knew it not only from his own divinations, but deduced it from the fact of the intervention of Simon If. He knew well that the old master would not have lifted a finger for anything less than a world war. Douglas therefore judged that if he could defeat Grey's purpose, it would involve the triumph of his own. Such forces, recoiling upon his head who had evoked them, would shatter him into a thousand fragments. Douglas, still weak from the destruction of his watcher, was particularly clear on this point. Arthwaite was to be the nominal head of the party in all things, and Abdul Bey was to be urged to support him vigorously in all ways that lay in his power. But if necessary, Gates was to fort Arthwaite and secure the allegiance of the Turk, bound to secrecy on the matter by showing him a card which Douglas then and there duly inscribed and handed over. Louis the Fifteenth tried a double-cross game of this sort on his ambassadors, but Douglas was not strong on history and knew nothing of how these experiments resulted. Now, apparently, had he taken to heart the words of the Gospel, If Satan be divided against Satan, how shall his kingdom stand? Still less did he realise that this ingenious plan had been suggested to him by Simon If. Yet it was so. This was the head of the counter-attack which the old mystic had agreed to deliver on behalf of Cyril Grey. It was only a quarter of an hour's work. The way of the Dow is the easiest as it is the surest. This is what simple Simon had done. Since all simple motion is one-pointed and its enemy is inertia, the swordsmith brings his sword to a single sharp edge. The Fletcher grinds his arrow barb to a fine point. Your dum-dum bullet will not penetrate as does your nickel tip and you cannot afford to use the former unless the power of penetration is so great as to reach the soft spots before the bullet expands and stops. This mechanical principle is perfectly applicable in magic. Therefore, when there is need to resist a magical attack, your best method will be to divide your antagonist's force. Douglas had already lost a pawn in the game. Akbar Pasha, having gone to his destruction through setting up an idea of his own, apart from and inconsistent with the plan of his superior. The defect is inherent in all black magic, because that art is itself a thing set up against the universal will. If it were not negligibly small, it would destroy the universe, just as the bomb throwing anarchists would succeed in destroying society if he amounted to, say, a third of the population. Now Simple Simon at this time did not know Douglas, the enemy general, but he was in the closest possible magical touch with him, for he had so absorbed the thing in the garden into himself, and that thing had been a part of Douglas. So he set himself to the complete assimilation of that thing. He made certain that it should be part of himself for ever. His method of doing this was as simple as usual. He went over the universe in his mind and set himself to reconcile all contradictions in a higher unity. Beginning with such gross things as the colours of the spectrum, which were only partialities of white light, he resolved everything that came into his mind, until he reached such abstractions as matter and motion, being and form, and by this process worked himself up into a state of mind which was capable of grasping these sublime ideas, which unite even these ultimate antinomies. That was all. Douglas, still in magical touch with that watcher, could feel it being slowly digested, so to say, by some other magician. This, incidentally, is the final fate of all black magicians, to be torn piecemeal for lack of the love which grows by giving itself to the beloved again and again, 
until its eye is continuous with existence itself. Whoso loveth his life shall lose it, is the corresponding scriptural phrase. So Douglas, who might at that moment have saved himself by resignation, was too blind to see the way, and acquired blindness resulting from repeated acts whose essence was the denial of the unity of himself with the rest of the universe. And so he fought desperately against the assimilation of his watcher. It's mine, not yours, he raged. To the steady and continuous affirmation of true unity in all diversity which Simon If was making, he opposed the affirmation of duality. The result was that his whole mind was aflame with the passion of contrasting things, of playing forces off against each other. When it came to practical decisions, he divided his forces and deliberately created jealousy and hatred where cooperation and loyalty should have been the first and last consideration. Yet Simon If had used no spell but love. Chapter 12 of Brother Onofrio, His Stoutness and Valiance, and of the Misadventures that Came Thereby to the Black Lodge. The ecclesiastic is a definite type of man. The Italian priest has changed his character in three thousand years as little as he has his costume. Brother Onofrio's father happened to be a free-thinking anti-clerical, a pillar of masonry, otherwise his son would have surely have been a bishop. The type is perfectly pagan, whatever the creed. It is robust and subtle, spiritual and sensual, adroit in manipulation of inferiors and superiors alike. It has the courage which vigorous health and the consciousness of its own validity combine to give, and where courage will not serve the turn, astuteness deftly takes its place. A stupid pedant like Edward Arthwite is the very feeblest opponent for such a man. Brother Onofrio, while successfully practising magic, was quite ready at a moment's notice to throw the whole theory overboard with a horse laugh, and at the same time to reckon his action in so doing a branch of magic also. It was the beginning of the duplicate brain development which Jill Grey had cultivated to so high a point of perfection. But Arthwaite was in the fetters of his own egoism, while he pronounced himself father and grandfather of all spiritual science in language, that would have seemed stilted and archaic to Henry James, or Osric, and presumptuous in the mouth of an archangel. He was the bond-slave of utterly insignificant writers, fakers of magical grimoires of the 14th century, hawkers of spells and conjurations to a benighted peasantry who wished to bewitch cows or to prevent their neighbours from catching fish. Uffwaite had published a book to show the folly of such works, but in practice they were his only guide. In particular he swore by the black pule, which seemed to him less dangerous than the grand grimoire, or the forgery attributed to Pope Honoris. He wanted to evoke the devil, but was terrified lest he should be successful. However, nobody could be more pedantically pious than he in following out the practical prescriptions of these absurd charm books. This individual might usually have been discovered during that honeymoon in the Naples villa, seated in the armchair of the apartment which he had rented in the Galilea, Vatiria. He would be clad in a frock coat of city cut, for he affected the professional man, and his air would be preoccupied. The arrival of his colleagues for consultation would apparently startle him from a profound speculation upon the weightier matters of the law. It would be only by an effort that he spoke in English. The least distraction would send him back into Latin, Greek or Hebrew, none of which languages he understood. He was a peddler of words. His mind was a rag-and-bone shop of worthless and disjointed medievalism. After a severe struggle, he would proceed to an allocution. He never spoke. He monologized. The first formal conference took place when they had been about a week in Naples. My father's learned in art magic, he began, addressing Gates and Abdul, venerable and archetypal doctors of the hermetic arcanum. It hath been sacramentally imposed upon our sophistic tabernacle by the monumentally aggravated psychomentality of those whose names in respect of known dedications must here 
Jacques de Nos, the hild ob Danaios, as I should at Umbriate advise thee, for is it not script concerning Cowans in the archives of the Clermont Harodim, that a term in fine should meet the orbit and currency of the heretic and apostate, quemin tartorum conjuro, height grey, in his Arapagus of the adverse hierarchy, I exiterate, clam populo, that all warrants of precursors felt no ratifications per adventure in the actual concatenation, said me judici, it is meliorated that by virtue and cosmodominicity of satanas, cogneomen ineffable quod reverentissim pro locure. The opus confronts the Sir Knights of the Black Chapter, in Vio Sura Propria, in the authentic valley, and this Lucas Tenebrosia, Neopolitanasius, as the near, nay the next, conflagration of barbaric pilum against Retirio Ludibri. Worthy fathers and reverend in the doctrine, Salututiae in Sumo Imperio, Patutum Orbum, in the supranormal Donna of Orcus and of Phlegatophon. Sufficit. The Turkish diplomat spoke nine languages, but not this one. Gates, who had known Afreit for many years, explained that these remarks, formidable in appearance, meant only that Grey ought to be killed at any time, on general principles, but that as they were specially charged with that task by their leaders, so much the better. The conference thus prosperally inaugurated proved a lengthy one. How, indeed, could it be otherwise? for Afwait was naturally slow of thought and speech. It took him some time to warm up to real eloquence, and then he became so long-winded and lost himself so completely in his words and phrases that he would speak for many hours without conveying a single idea of any kind to his hearers, or even having one to convey. But the upshot of his conversation upon this occasion was that an attempt should be made to poison the household magically by bewitching the food supplied to them from the market. Certain succulent shellfish, called von Giol, very popular in Naples, were selected as a material basis, because the appurtenance and charter was Bikel Klippif, as Afway explained. Into these mollusks, therefore, might be conjured a spirit of Mars, of them that bear witness unto Bartzabal, in the hope that those who partook of them might be stricken with some type of fever, fevers and all acute diseases being classified as martial. It was unfortunate for these plans that Brother Onofrio habitually took the precaution to purify and consecrate all food that came into the house before it reached the kitchen, and further, anticipating some such attempt, he had everything tested psychometrically by one of his acolytes, whom he had trained especially in sensitiveness to all such subtle impressions. The shellfish were consequently discovered to be charged with the martial air current. Brother Onofrio smiled hugely and proceeded to call upon the divine forces of Mars, before which even Bartzibal trembles every day, and thus having converted himself into a high-power engine of war, sat down to a gargantuan banquet, eating the entire consignment himself. The result was that the unfortunate upweight was seized with violent, in intractable colic, which kept him twisted in agony on his bed for forty-eight hours. Gates had taken no part in this performance, he knew that how dangerous it was, and how likely to recoil upon the rash practitioner. But he did some genuinely useful work. He had been to the church in the village near Possipilipo, whose tower overlooked the butterfly net, and he had persuaded the priest to allow him continual access to that tower on the pretext of being an artist. And indeed, he had been a pretty amateur talent for painting in watercolours, some people thought it stronger than his verses. For ten days he watched the butterfly net with extreme care, and he wrote down the routine of the inhabitants hour by hour. Nothing escaped him of their doings in the garden, and, as it happened, the preponderating portion of their work lay out of doors. He could make nor head nor tower of the fact that the most important people were apparently doing no magic of any kind, but careless lovers, enjoying the first fruits of their flight to the south. But Douglas put two and two together very cleverly, even from the first report. He noted also the intelligence and ability of Gates, and made a memorandum to use him up quickly and destroy him. 
Without divining the exact intention of Cyril Grey, he rightly concluded that this honeymoon was not so simple as it seemed. In fact, he recognised it as the core of the apple. He telegraphed Gates to redouble his watch upon the lovers and to report instantly if any marked change occurred in their habits. Meanwhile, Edwin Uthwaite was busy with the black poulet. There is a method of describing a pentagram upon a doorstep which is infallible. The first person who crosses it receives a shock which may drive him insane or even kill him. A magician would naturally be suspicious if he found anything of this kind on his front doorstep. So Uthwaite cleverly determined to paint the pentagram in gum Arabic, which would hardly be visible. Accordingly, he went to the butterfly net at dead of night, armed with this means of grace, and set to work by the light of a candle lamp. He was careful to make the pentagram so large that it was impossible to cross the bridge without stepping over it. Absorbed in his inspiring task, he did not notice, until the last stroke was in its place, that he was himself hemmed in between his pentagram and the door of the villa. He crouched in terror for the best part of an hour, then a hint of daylight made him fearful of discovery. He was forced to make a move of some sort, and he found that by careful siddling he could escape to the parapet of the bridge. But he was no climber. He overbalanced and fell into the chasm, being lucky to escape with a severe shaking. On his limping way back to Naples, he was overtaken by an icy shower of rain, and as he got into bed, too late to avoid a nasty chill, which kept him in bed for a week, he had the irritating reflection that his pentagram must have been washed away. But he had not become known as the most voluminous of modern pendants without perseverance. His literary method was that of the tank. It was not agile, it was not versatile, it was exposed to artillery attack, but it proceeded. He was as comprehensive as the catalogue of the British Museum, and almost as extensive, but he was not arranged. Such a man was not to be deterred by two failures, or forty-two. Indeed, but for the frank criticism of Gates, he would have counted them successes. For his third experiment, he chose the wonder-working serpent, whose possession confers the power of attracting love. The appeal lay in the failure of Abdul to make any impression upon Lisa, whom he had courted in characteristically local manner by appearing, guitar in hand, below the terrace where she had been dedicated to the moon. He caught her there alone and called her by her name. She recognised him instantly. She had been violently attracted to him at the ball where they had originally met, and, until she had seen Cyril, regretted constantly that she had missed the opportunity. The memory of that faulted desire sprang vehement upon her, but she was at the white heat of her passion for Cyril. Even so, she half hesitated. She wanted to keep Abdul on ice, so to speak, for a future occasion. Such action was as instinctive with her as breathing. But her obligation was still fresh in her mind. She was pledged not to communicate with the outer world. She ignored him. She turned and left the garden without so much as a gesture and he went back to Naples in a black fury against her. The wonder-working serpent was therefore an operation entirely to his taste. Gates fought the line of attack hopeful. He was totally sceptical of Lisa's virtue or any woman's, and he had lived on women long enough to make his view arguable within the limits of his experience. He bade Abdul try again. Good, then let magic aid. In order to possess the wonder-working serpent, it is necessary in the words of the grimoire, to buy an egg without haggling, which, by the way, indicates the class of person for and by whom the book was written. This egg is to be buried in a cemetery at midnight, and every morning at sunrise it must be watered with brandy. On the ninth day a spirit appears and demands your purpose. You reply, I am watering my plant. This occurs on three successive days. At the midnight following the egg is dug up and found to contain a serpent with a cock's head. This amiable animal answers to the name of Ambrosio. Carry it in your bosom, and your suit inevitably prospers. Athwaite put this scheme into careful rehearsal, and having got the conjurations and ceremonies perfect, for the egg must be buried with full military honours, as it were, he reached the third day without mishap. But at this point a spirit appeared, a guardian of the cemetery, and dissatisfied with his answers, took him to the police station as a wandering lunatic. 
A less otherworldly master of the dark sciences might have bribed the official, but F. Waite's self-importance once again stood in his way. He got in deeper, and in the end it was Gates who offered to be responsible for him, and persuaded the precious consul to use influence for his release. As so many workers of magic have done, from the Yokan and Bastaland to Tonga and Mongolia, Afwait attributed his defeats to the superior cunning and wickedness of his opponents. Gates himself had varied his pleasures by a much more serious attempt to create a magical link with the garrison. From his tower he had observed many pigeons upon the hillside, and he began to tame these, spreading corn upon the tower. In three days they were eaten out of his hand. He then trained them to recognise him and follow him from place to place. A week later he found a moment when the garden was deserted save for a single patrol and threw his grain over the wall. The pigeons flocked to it and fed. Now it so happened that the patrolling magician was unsuspicious. He was aware that the benign influence of the house made its gardens attractive. There flowers bloomed brighter than elsewhere and all nature's wanderers seemed to look to it as their refuge. They felt instinctively the innocence and goodwill of the inhabitants and thronged those hospitable terraces. When Gates moved on, the pigeons followed his next throw round the first corner. He placed the remains of his supply of corn in a small heap on the ground. The pigeons unsuspectedly approached, and he threw a net over half a dozen of them. This was a great point gained, for the Black Lodge was in possession of living things that had come from within the guarded precinct. It would be easy to attack the inmates by means of sympathetic magic. As it chanced, two of the birds were male, but pigeons being of the general nature of Venus, it was decided to try to identify them with the least male persons of the garrison, namely the four women and the two boys. Accordingly, ribbons were tied to the necks of the birds and the names of the intended victims inscribed upon them. Magical ceremonies were now made, Gates, who took a real interest in the experiment, being the leader. When he considered the identification adequate, he placed red pepper on the tongues of the birds and was rewarded the following morning by seeing Sister Clara turn upon one of her girls with a gesture of rage. He could even hear faintly the tones of anger in her voice. But Brother Onofrio had not failed to observe the same thing, and he defined instantly that a breach had been made in his circle. He went immediately to Sister Clara and compelled her attention by a sign of authority that no initiate dare overlook. Sister, he said very gently, you do not speak with man. What cause, then, can there be for bitterness? She answered him still angrily. The house is upside down, she said. Ilio is as irritable as an eczema. The boys have both made insulting faces at every one they have seen this morning. And the girls are absolutely impudent. This is a matter for me as in charge of the defence of the circle. Sister Clara uttered a sharp exclamation. It had not occurred to her to think of it that way. I should be obliged, continued Brother Onofrio, if you could use your way to impose a rule of silence for seven days from sunset to night. Exception, of course, in the invocations. I will warn the boys. Do you take up the matter of Iliel and the girls? It shall be done. Brother Onofrio went off to the private room where he did his own particular magic. He saw that a serious inroad had been made, but his divination on this occasion failed to enlighten him. His favourite device was the tarot, those mysterious cards with their twenty-two hieroglyphic trumps, and as a rule he was able to discover all kinds of unknown matters by their use. But on this attempt he was baffled by the monotony of his answer. However he used the cards, they always reverted to a single symbol, the trump numbered sixteen, which is called the Blasted Tower and has some reference to the legend of Babel. I know, he muttered himself, irritated by the persistence of the card. I know it's Mars, which is the planet signified by that particular hieroglyph. But I wanted a lot more than that. I asked, what is the trouble? From whom is the trouble? Where is the trouble? What shall I do? And the same card answers all the questions. The next day, Gates found that the tongues of the birds were shriveled up, and he divined that his mode of attack had been detected, a precaution taken. He proceeded by drugging the pigeons with the vapour of ether. In the house the result was immediate. The six people affected showed signs of intoxication and dizziness, coupled with a strong feeling of suffocation. 
Sister Clara was less troubled than the others, and she recognised the magical cause of the symptoms. She ran quickly to Brother Onofrio. He saw instantly that a new attack was in progress, and gave the sign agreed upon for retirement to a specially consecrated room in the square tower, a sort of inner circle or citadel. The victims gathered in this room within a few minutes, and their symptoms abated on the instant. But Brother Onofrio had a glimpse of light, as he assisted one of the two boys, who was almost choking to reach the refuge. The tower caught his eye, and it flashed upon him that perhaps the tower was referring to an actual tower. It was only one step to think of the tower of the church, and running into the garden, he saw that a man was standing there, evidently engaged in watching the house of the magicians. Brother Onofrio, quick insight, decided him instantly upon the course to follow. The tarot trump in question represents a tower struck by lightning, from which figures of men are seen falling. He laughed joyously. His favourite method of divination had vindicated itself supremely. His four questions had indeed a single answer. W. S. Gilbert informs us that a deed of blood and fire and flames was meat and drink to simple James, and to find himself approached upon the plain of Mars was like mother's milk to brother on a frio, for he was himself of the strongest martial type, having been born with Scorpio, the night house of Mars, rising and the planet himself conjoined with Herschel in the mid-heaven in the sign of the lion, with the sun rising in trine, and Jupiter conjoined with Saturn, making an additional trine from the sixth house, which governs secret things such as magic. It was as formidable a combination as Mars could make in a thousand years. He happened also to belong to that grade of the order, Adeptus Major, which specialises in Mars. Athwaite and company had unwittingly come to meet him where he was the strongest. To invoke Mars is to establish a connection with that order of nature which we class as martial. It may be remembered how a man came to a doctor, suffering internal pangs of no mean order from having swallowed by mistake some pills intended for a horse. Asked how it came to happen, he explained that he had been administering them to the horse by blowing them down his throat, through a tube, but the horse had blown first. This is, of course, the danger in every magical experiment and this constitutes the evergreen glory of every man who adventures upon it. For at each new portal he enters naked and newborn to confront, he knows not what, malignant enemies. The sole excuse for the existence of our miserable species lies not in intelligence, but in this masterful courage, this aspiration to extend the empire of the spirit. Even the blackest of magicians like Douglas, or the stupidest like Uprate, is a higher type of being, than the bourgeoisie who goes along with his nose on the ground picking up gold bricks in the mire. Now when brother Onofrio found Gates perched upon the campanile, he saw the martial symbol complete, alone awaiting the lightning flash. There was no need for him to produce a thunderstorm, as he would have been if Gates had been an ordinary man, accessible only to coarse influences. No, brother Onofrio knew how to assimilate the church tower to the blasted tower of the tarot, without appealing to the material forces of nature, so-called, as if matter was not comprehensive as nature herself. But the English language is full of these booby traps. He went to his laboratory, took out the tarot card 16, and set it up on the altar. He lighted the fire upon the tripod, and he kindled the incense of dragon's blood that stood ready in the iron censer. He then put upon his head the steel crown of Mars, Fawny with its four flashing pentagrams, and he took in his hands the heavy sword, as long as himself, with a two-edged blade tapering from a width at the junction of the hilt of no less than five inches. Chanting the terrible conjurations of Mars, fierce war songs of the olden peoples of the world, invocations of mighty deities throned upon the thunder, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, he sent forth his lightnings and consumed them. Brother Onofrio, began the war dance of the serpent, the invoking dance of Mars. Close coiled upon the altar at first, he took gradually a wider sweep, constantly revolving on himself, but his feet tracing a complex spiral curve. On reaching the door of the room, he allowed the serpent to stretch out its length, and never twisting on himself, came out upon the terrace. Gates was still at his post upon the campanile. He had been about to go, but this new feature of the routine of the house riveted him to his place. 
This was just what Douglas needed to know. He leant upon the parapet of the tower, watching with infinite eagerness and minuteness the convulsions of the adept. Once upon the terrace, Brother Onofrio proceeded to coil up his serpent after him, diminishing the sweep of his spirals until he was at zero, merely rotating on himself. Then he began the second part of his work, the dance of the sword. Slowly he began to cause his feet to trace a pentagram, and he allowed the sword to leave his body as he quickened his pace, just as one sees the weights of the ball governor of a steam engine fly outwards as pressure and speed leap higher. Gates was altogether fascinated by the sight. In the sunlight, this scarlet figure with lights darting from every brilliance of its steel was a magnificent spectacle, almost bewildering in its intensity. Faster and faster warred the adept, his sword swaying about him like a garment of light, and his voice louder and fiercer with every turn assumed the very majesty of thunder. Gates watched with open mouth. He was learning much from this man. He began to perceive the primeval energy of the universe under a vow, the magic clang and rush of blazing stars in the blind emptiness of space. And suddenly, Brother Onofrio stopped dead. His voice snapped short into a silence far more terrible than any word, and his long sword was still, fearfully still, stretched out like a shaft of murderous light, the point towards the tower. Gates was suddenly aware that he had all along been the object of the dance, and then his brain began to reel. Had the whirling flashes hypnotised him? He could not think. The world went black from him. Automatically he clutched at the parapet, but he pitched headlong over it and crashed upon the ground a hundred feet below. On the terrace, Brother Onofrio was beginning the banishing spirals of Mars, with songs of triumph into which stole, as if surreptitiously, some hint of that joy of love which, from the beginning of time, has welcomed the victorious soldier. 